So far, we've talked about DNA, mutation, genes and alleles, and we were just about to utter Missouri-style artificial horse vagina. I mean, evolution. Which means what, exactly? Evolution of life is the continuous change in the composition of heritable characteristics of biological populations over a chain of successive generations. Uh, um, what? Doesn't it mean some sort of progress? That monkey becomes man? And there's the dumb fish that swims ashore, grows legs, uh, hawks and can suddenly run and breathe. Isn't that evolution? Well, almost, but no. Let's start at the beginning. What is a biological population? A group of individuals belonging to the same species that live in the same geographical region and have the opportunity to mate with each other is called a population in genetics. The opportunity to mate is quite a broad concept, considering that all the men in Los Angeles and Jennifer Lawrence belong to the same population. If we put the population in a blender, then filter and count all the genes and their alleles, we get the composition of the heritable characteristics of the population. Its change can occur in several ways. Let's take a very simple LORP population only consisting of two individuals. Regarding the Colorp gene, Larry has a genotype of XYXB, while Gina carries XYX0 alleles. The allele composition of the population, therefore, is 50% XY, 25% XB, and 25% X0. Larry and Gina hate each other's guts. F*** you! F*** you! Unfortunately, the survival of the population depends on them, so they are willing to make sacrifices. Shall we get intimate? Yeah, I guess. Which one of their alleles they pass on is up to chance. So the next generation doesn't necessarily have the same genetic composition as the original one. As it happens, the offspring of Larry and Gina have genotypes of XYXY and XYX0, making the allele composition of their generation 75% XY and 25% X0. The presence of XY has increased compared to XB, so much so that XB has vanished from the gene pool. The phenomenon of random events changing the allele composition of a population is called genetic drift. A fine example of it is the change due to the random inheritance of parental alleles, but other unavoidable events can lead to genetic drift as well. Let's say someone's sitting on the toilet fiddling with Facebook on his phone, when suddenly a 3.5-ton comet drops on his head, taking his genes immediately out of the population. Alleles that are only present in small numbers can be permanently lost due to genetic drift. If the offspring of Larry and Gina, say, James and Kersey, breed with each other, I know it's incest, but it's just the two of them, give them a break. So in the third generation, X0 can easily drop out as well. When only a single type of allele of a gene remains in the population, losing any number of copies of it will not alter the allele composition anymore, the genetic drift will stop and the allele will become fixed. There was a movie, uh, Eyebender or something, in which biologist Connor McClude describes genetic drift with one simple phrase. There can be only one. In a large population, where alleles are present in countless copies, the gene pool will drift for many, many generations, up and down, left and right, back and forth, but the disappearance of alleles is a statistical certainty in time and alleles that have drifted out do not come back. Genetic drift changes the heritable characteristics of populations over successive generations and as such is one of the driving forces behind evolution. However, it will in time erase all diversity. And it's really awkward if your girlfriend is the spitting image of your mom. But looking around, this isn't really what we see. Unless you live with a bucket over your head, the diversity of life strikes you in the face. This is only possible if the drift is counteracted somehow, for example by replacing lost alleles with new ones. 
This is performed by our good old friend Mutation. But something's still off. Both Mutation and Genetic Drift are totally random. If it was up to them, we'd all be chaotic, structureless blobs of blah. But this is not the case. Life on Earth is surprisingly harmonious. Just take this cow. It eats grass. As you know, grass is inedible crap. The cow, however, has special lips, tongue, teeth, stomach with four compartments and long, fart-filled guts perfect for digesting grass. All this thanks to the coordinated effort of countless genes. As if the cow was designed to eat grass. Uh, this can't be the result of random chance. Well, it isn't. Maybe it's evident that only those living beings can pass on their genes that successfully reproduce. For this to happen, it's quite useful to stay alive, to have an urge to mate, and to find a cooperating partner. Meanwhile, Mother Nature tries to f*** you over at every turn. It's too cold, too hot, there's no water, there's too much water, there's no food, or there is, but your mom didn't make it, sharks want to eat you, bears want to eat you, and on top of all that, Gina chose Larry over me just because he doesn't look like Picasso's 1972 self-portrait. Nature will put every living being to test in its own environment. Those individuals that make it through can pass on their genes to their offspring. Those that fail, however, will mostly die without reproducing, thus their genes will not appear in the next generation. Over time, therefore, unfavorable characteristics slowly disappear from the population, while favorable ones stay around. This process is called natural selection and, unlike mutation and genetic drift, it's most definitely not random. Mutation randomly generates new genes and alleles and nature tosses out the bad ones while keeping the good ones. Genetic drift flavors the process with an element of luck so no allele can ever feel safe. But what makes a mutation beneficial or detrimental? There's no formula for that, it all depends on the environment. If instead of lungs, the seventh series of Dallas develops in your chest on VHS tape, it's a death sentence at birth in most environments and can therefore be called detrimental. But if your hair follicles produce not one but three strands of hair each, is that good or bad? Well, in a cold environment it's good, in a hot one it's bad. And if the weather changes all the time, who the hell knows? Let's leave the calculations to the zoologist with a slight salamander poop smell crouching in the bushes. But of course the effects of mutation are not limited to amazing and total crap. There's a wide spectrum between the two and every mutation that doesn't prevent the passing on of one's genes has passed the test of natural selection. At least until it gets tested again. This means that plenty of mutations that survive are basically neutral. They don't come with any tangible benefits or disadvantages. But the usefulness of mutations can change if competition between them arises. For example, as a cat, being just about faster than a mouse is only advantageous as long as there are plenty of mice around and you don't need to race an even faster cat for them. And if all the mice are gone, uh, there's no use running around like crazy, you need to enslave humanity instead. Life today is very different from life that was billions of years ago, because biological populations are in constant flux. Mutation is the engine of this change and natural selection is the steering wheel, always pointing in the direction of adaptation to the environment. And the genetic drift is the, uh, the, the dead cat hole or something, I don't know jack about cars. Whatever. This is evolution and it was first recognized by Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace. The latter always gets forgotten somehow. Of course, back in those days nobody knew about DNA, genes and mutation, and the whole idea seemed so bizarre that both of them got ridiculed and bombarded with snotty handkerchiefs. But they are the ones <laughs> laughing now. Or not, because they're dead. Anyway, they were right. 
But is evolution progress then? And where do all the species come from, not to mention life? Does whoever helps the weak go against evolution? And is it really true? After all, it's just a theory, right? Next time we'll clear up some misconceptions. The technical information in this video was fact-checked by Christian Sabo, zoologist genius. Get it? Gene, yes. <laughs> I thank him very much. If you've made it this far, why not like, comment or subscribe? Or check out my other videos. I know it would make at least one of us happy.